Let's talk now to security expert, military analyst, and former chief of Nigeria's uh, Defense Research and Development, retired Major General Henry Ayolai, who is in our Abuja studios. Good morning to you, General. Thank you for your time this morning. Good morning, Ladi. Thank you for having me. Good morning, viewers. The, this is a big blow to the Ukrainians. Uh, there's no sugarcoating that uh, because the Russians now have uh, the whole of that region in their grasp. And even by the admission of the Ukrainian president, uh, the Ukrainian forces are outgunned or they were outgunned in there and had to beat uh, a withdrawal. But how much of a problem is this for the Ukrainians, given the overall position uh, of uh, the war in Ukraine? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Well, there are many ways to look at this. Uh, I'll look at it from the side of uh, Russia. Uh, I would say, of course, it's a major victory for them uh, in the sense that uh, we know that the Donbass region has been uh, one of their main uh, military objective, uh, which, of course, is a limited objective, which I've, uh, I said uh, before, the, the first time we discussed this, I, I, I said it that um, I would advise that Russia should select some limited objective, which of course, the eastern side of Ukraine, where they have their kit and kin, has been one of the, of course, the basic reasons they gave for even starting the so-called special military operations. Okay, so it's a major victory for them. And of course, looking at it from the Ukrainian side, yeah, why? Maybe for the sake of propaganda, some of them may want to make it look like it's not a serious setback. Uh, but we know that. Uh, Again, I advised before, too, that left for me, I would have advised as President Zelensky to just let go that side of the country. Because even as it were, the, the sovereignty of this nation had been sabotaged based on the restlessness and restiveness in that part of the country. And uh, something must give, you know. So it, it could be a very good... Uh, area to negotiate and uh, bring this whole destruction to an end because i mean i'm so concerned about how does ukraine get restored and rebuilt after this whole huge uh, destruction going on and i see it as like a deliberate ploy of uh, russia to actually punish ukraine but if it's just to, uh, to fulfill or achieve their strategic goals it doesn't have to be this destructive and so you could see a whole lot of artillery bombardment, air bombardment, missile bombardment, all of this happening. It's like wanting to drive the point home that, look, this is the punishment you will get if you try this again. You know? So, uh, but again, even if I look at it at the neutral side, yes, one major victory does not necessarily translate to victory of the world. Victory in the battle and engagement uh, it's not necessarily, you know, equal to victory in the war. Of course, sometimes you can have victory in one battle, or one engagement or the other. And the, the war still goes on because, I mean, there's still other area theaters, other theaters in the war, other areas to capture and so on. So I think it's a good point uh, to, for both sides to think of one a diplomatic way of resolving the issue. Thank you very much. That, given that scenario, uh, of course, uh, we are hearing from, the, uh, from some of Ukraine's uh, backers that it is not yet time for peace talks. And uh, they are undertaking to arm Ukraine even more. But they are hampered by the fact that none of these partners is prepared to cross the line that Russia drew in the sand at the start of this conflict, which is that if Ukraine were to be given any offensive weapons, the country supplying such weapons uh, would be deemed an enemy and a co-combatant uh, in this war. And all the Western countries have tried to avoid that. In fact, they are very insistent on avoiding that in spite of the pleas uh, of the Ukrainian president, uh, continuous pleas uh, that more weapons, uh, more sophisticated weapons, weapons with longer ranges uh, uh, should be supplied. Now, if this continues to be the situation, uh, Yes, one victory or one 
battle victory does not mean you've won the war, but are we then just postponing the inevitable, especially when you talk about the amount of destruction that is going on? Yeah, thank you very much. That, that's a very tricky one. Uh, if you look at it, I, I would say that that part of the Russian threat has been issue, is something you can call an empty threat because uh, it's obviously not a credible threat. Because of course there have been weapons streaming in from different Western countries, including America. In fact, to the extent that uh, just last week, America again promised giving the national, uh, this uh, automated uh, surface to uh, a surface to air missile system that that America really holds very jealously because that's what they use to cover both the White House uh, the White House and the Pentagon so it's not usually one of those kind of platforms that they want to give to other nations but they've pledged that and work has started in you know in Senate and of course there have been all kind of platforms sent from this different part of uh, members of NATO and other Euro Western European uh, countries if I was looking at the, the list of you know, different military aids coming from uh, the different countries, uh, members of NATO in particular, and I see that America is, of course, number one, with a wide gap between the second, which is UK. I mean, while America has put in so far about $25 billion, the, the UK just, are just put in about $2.5 billion. So you can see the gap. And then, of course, you find, interestingly, Poland coming before Germany. And also, of course, all of this uh, are going on. Uh, I'm sure Russia is not thinking that it's going to not join, you know, them in the war. You know, I mean, that's why I say it's, it's an empty threat. But of course, I mean, some threats are credible, some are empty threats, you know, but that will continue. Of course, I mean, that's the minimum that NATO owes Ukraine because they are, it's more or less like they put them into this trouble. So at least they have to be seen to show that support, you know. So I, I don't think... Uh, that is going to stop any day. Of course, we see in the midst of that other countries within the European setting too, who, well, for their own enlightened self-interest and the best interest of their national security and all of that. Actually, when you think of the issue of the strategic importance of uh, Russia in the area of energy, the politics of energy, of course, each nation will chart a course that is in the best interest of its, no, its own national interest. Okay, so. You see that also going on. We see recently, we see the president of Indonesia visiting. We see the president of Belarusia even telling Russia to, to be prepared to use their nuke. Of course, I mean, that just to show support, but you don't have to tell them for that. In fact, from the beginning of this war, Russia had actually lowered its alert state and its requirement before the use of nuclear weapons. So, all of that were set, you know, and those are part of the very uh, tricky areas that had to, you know, to be watched from the beginning. You know, I, all of this reminds me of the, you know, the, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis and how America handled it. How did then, of course, President uh, uh, F. J. Uh, John K. Uh, Kennedy, you know, was the president at the time, and of course, on the Soviet Union side, you had the uh, Nikita Khrushchev, and how eventually, it's still, it was still a diplomatic solution that brought that crisis to an end after 13 days of serious brainstorming and all of that. And it was simple, no, nobody lost face. So, you know, both sides were, you know, the, the, the conditions were, f I mean, sufficiently face-saving that uh, nobody felt hum humiliated or sovereignty had been injured in any way. And it was simple, it was simple for America to say, okay, we, we make a promise that we will not attack Cuba, and then we remove the uh, uh, missiles in, in Turkey, which were the two conditions that was, you know, the Soviet Union gave. Of course, the Soviet Union removed the missiles, and we had peace. And the world breathed a, a sigh of relief for what appeared to be a high tension that was going to leak, uh, lead to nuclear clash. Okay, so that's why I think that this is a good point. And maybe if there are people that Zelensky listens to, he, they should tell him. You know, that look, this is a good point to think again because the damage to his nation is so huge. And the reconstruction and rehabilitation will we, we take several years. Of course, I know you may still get help from the same Western countries, but it's better now than later. That's my advice. Thank you. I can't let you, I can't let you go, uh, and I'll, I'll expect your answer in about a minute or, or, or so. 
Uh, militarily now, Russia in control of eastern Ukraine, most of eastern Ukraine now. Uh, but then on the other hand, you have two countries that were previously uh, neutral uh, on another side of its border. I'm talking about Sweden and uh, Finland now joining NATO. So d did it militarily, did it score itself an own goal by going into Ukraine, even if it comes out victorious? Yes. Uh, in fact, uh, thank you very much. That just buttresses the point I made earlier, that uh, nations will weigh their options, their strategic options. And they are not going to say, just because uh, Russia said this, then they will not do that which is in their best interest. Of course, Finland and uh, Norway the, that, that joined, yeah, they, of course, I mean, they will have weighed their options. They were also virtually in the same place where Ukraine was. Maybe the only reason why they, are, they were not attacked concurrently with Ukraine, maybe other factors. Because again, we know that the, the affinity between Russia, Ukraine, and Belarusia as the original Slavic uh, states uh, will also will be one of the things that underscored why Russia will feel as aggravated as they are towards Russia and not the same feeling towards the other surrounding 14 nations who, who are actually rooting to join NATO. So, uh, well, everybody will count his cost and his loss at the end of the day, but at least maybe Russia had made the point, you know. In deterrence and compliance, you, you want to show credibility of, you know, the threat of punishment. And I think that's perhaps what Russia will have achieved. Of course, they have their own casualties to deal with too. They have, have their own destructions and losses to deal with too. Yeah, thank Indeed. you very much. Indeed, indeed. Major General Henry Ayala, as usual, thank you for your time and for your perspective this morning. We look forward to having you again soon. Thank you very much. Coming up after the break, Russia adds multiple agricultural products to the list of exports to be paid with rubles. Please stay on with us.